Again to my weekly live stream slash podcast slash live feed slash stream of what's going on in the world according to the point of view of me, Jeff Cliff. Uh, this is hopefully going live and hopefully you can hear me. Uh, I don't have any kind of feedback to know if the audio is working or not. So if you can hear me, uh, say something. But uh, we're going to keep going because I have a tight schedule, unlike last week, so uh, there's going to be a clip coming up here uh, any moment now, and uh, there's going to be a lot of audio from the voice of Long Island. This is one of them. Another opening of another smoke. Another ghost kick and another shelf. And there's another smoke. Another ghost kick and another shelf. Right. And hopefully that came through okay. I thought that was a kind of neat thing to start out with. Hopefully that sounded good. Uh, I have no idea again how this is sounding. So anyway, uh, hopefully last week uh, there was a bunch of problems with the sound. And so I have a little bit of a different setup now. Uh, so I can't tell uh, if the sound is any better or if it's like super loud or super quiet or something like that. Uh, but let me know. Uh, anyway, I have a bunch of things that happened this week that I want to talk about. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have anyone here uh, to sort of shoot ideas off with, uh, but I do have a couple of things that I've kind of queued up. So I'm going to start going through them uh, as I kind of see fit here. I'm just going to, I've got my screen shared. Um, and so you can see, you can kind of read along with me as I go through these things. Uh, but one of the things that happened this week is uh, the INF Treaty was withdrawn by Russia. Uh, and so I was surfing around Twitter, and uh, one of the things on the official uh, Russian government site was the uh, um, backing away from this tr treaty that kept, or was one of the pillars that kept the world from going to nuclear war in the 1980s. Uh, as you can see here, the U.S. approved it in 1988. The Ru or the Russian side approved it also in 1988. This is going back to like when I was a small child. Uh, it's so something that we kind of all take for granted that we should not have to worry about. Uh, you know, that there are a lot of ways that nuclear war can happen, and a lot of uh, mistakes that can be made, uh, tensions that can you know spin out of control. Uh, but this is one of the things that was supposed to keep things at least a little bit rational, or at least a little bit under control, at least a little bit uh, sensible. Um, 
Now, we could go into the details about whether or not the United States or Russia uh, were actually following through with following the terms of this treaty. We could go into the details of the treaty. Uh, I don't personally think that it's worth going that deep into it, uh, other than to note that it failed. And it failed this, uh, you know, this past little while. May I, again, I haven't got the, the it looks like it's, it's um, you know, formally from the U.S. side on the, the 1st of February. I didn't hear about it until now. The, again, this is something that when we have high-level political discussions, this should be pretty high up on the top of the list. Uh, the fact that on both the Trump side and on the Russian side, uh, our high-level political officials are failing to uphold the key components keeping the world from going to nuclear war, of which the INF Treaty is one of them. And so this is something you know to, to worry about, to talk about. Uh, if, if there are people in your life who know about some of the details of this, it may be worth uh, talking to them about it a little bit. Maybe if you have you know, more uh, of a background in this than I do, you can you know, send me an email or something uh, to, to get me quite, kind of more in the loop. Uh, but I have, over the past uh, couple months, been reading some of the old WikiLeaks cables uh, from the early 1970s. And one of the things that you see in the early 1970s all throughout until the Soviet Union fell, is there was a period of time where there were a whole bunch of treaties signed um, and a whole bunch of treaties negotiated as an attempt to get the world from spinning apart and going to war, to keep the United States and the Soviet Union to cooperating on little bits and pieces of where they could cooperate. And this was one of the treaties that came out of that. Um, and so what can we expect without the INF Treaty? Well, let's take a look. Uh, what did they kind of expect uh, to not have this kind of come out? Uh, let's see here. I saw it earlier on this page. Uh, suspension. Reactions to withdrawal. Okay, so these aren't... Uh, the SS-8 is one of the things that the Russians are accused of doing wrong here, but actually I want to find... Uh, let's see, background. Okay, anyway, uh, so the details aren't coming out as quickly as I'd hoped, but anyway, uh, long story short, uh, what we can expect is a temptation from both the United States and Russia and other nuclear powers, including China, Israel, Pakistan, India, uh, and possibly Saudi Arabia soon, um, to invest more in nuclear weapons. Because now, without this treaty, uh, there's just one more reason why uh, nations are going to be paranoid, are going to want to invest uh, more of their budgets in nuclear weapons. And why is this important? Why, why, why talk about this? Because nuclear weapons are expensive. And so the cost of the nuclear weapon program in the United States is enormous. It is in the trillions of dollars. So from 1940 to 1996, the United States spent a minimum of $5.5 .5 trillion on its nuclear weapons program. Now, to give some kind of context about this, like what was uh, Trump asking for for the wall that he wanted to build? Like two billion? So like point, you know, two, two out of 5,500, you know, the, that, the, it's a pennies on the dollar. It's, it, it's, it's not even worth considering compared to the amount of money that the United States spent on their nuclear program. Uh, what could the United States have gotten for $5.5 .5 trillion over the course of 50 years? Probably a Canada-style healthcare system for starters. Uh, they would be able to probably pay off more, you know, a good portion, not their entire debt, but a, a good chunk of it. Um, th there's just so much you can do with $5.5 .5 trillion. Like, a trillion dollars here and a trillion dollars there is, it, you know, sooner or later it starts adding up to some real, real money, right? So, oh, did my stream just die? Oh my god. My stream just died. Oh, so sad.
So I have no idea how much. Oh. So I, I have, have no, no idea, idea how, how much of that we just lost. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too long. It sounds like maybe only a minute or two. Um, unfortunately, there's a bug in this Chromebook. Uh, I know Chromebooks are horrible, uh, but it's what I have right now. And it, it basically closes tabs in the background if I'm not looking at them. So maybe this like going to uh, show you what I'm reading as I'm reading is not going to work out very well. Uh, but we are going to try it uh, without actually showing you the articles. So hopefully this stream stays up. And I'm just going to uh, get my little icon back so we can get back on track here. Uh, so we're not getting infinite regress, infinite regress. Uh, let's see here. You'd think if it's the only tab, it'll stay open. There we go. And hopefully the sound is, oh, look at that. Is it the terminal that's killing my stream? Wow, it's totally the terminal. Well, I guess uh, the recording is going to have some interesting stuff on it, but Okay, so apparently I can't open a terminal and have the live stream open at the same time. And I also can't have the websites that I had uh, or that I was planning on showing you uh, as I was recording this at the same time. So this is going to be a little bit more difficult than I thought it was. Um, I might try to get uh, a, a video recording of the the things that I'm looking at for the next week's uh, version of this. Uh, however, uh, I'd like to kind of carry on as as we, I want this to be kind of a quick and um, easier to listen to thing. So moving along. Uh, so th the point that I was trying to get at before my live stream unfortunately cut off two or three times here uh, is that the, when we see the, I, you know, this, this INF treaty uh, fail, uh, it is a signal to the rest of the world to expect one nuclear instability or more instability and more pressure being put on the existing uh, means that we have of preventing nuclear war. So the SALT treaty, if it's still around, I haven't double checked that it, it is still around. That's going to be one of the things that is going to get pressure next. Um, there are other treaties and other negotiations that have been done over the past what, 30 years uh, that and, and there's things, open channels of communication between the United States, Russia, possibly including China, India, Pakistan, etc., uh, that are going to be now, should be looked at more closely because we want to make sure that they work. And if they aren't enough, we want to make sure that our politicians understand that the world needs more uh, certainty that the protections against nuclear war are going to hold up if there comes to be a point where two countries with nuclear weapons like India or Pakistan or even like the United States and Russia suddenly find themselves in a situation uh, that is politically charged enough that we start thinking about pulling the trigger 
uh, or at least the people in the executive of some either of those two governments start thinking about pulling the trigger. I don't feel comfortable knowing that Trump and or Putin uh, may be that person. So uh, it is worth thinking about and talking about with the people around you. What can we do uh, to get that kind of level of certainty up a little bit? Anyway, um, that was the one thing. So that, that there's there's other things going on in the world other than this this one treaty failing, which has been failing for a while. It's not you know if you're following it that closely, it probably doesn't even seem like news. Uh, it is important, but again, it's, it's not the only thing going on in the world. Uh, another thing going on in the world is the Recording Industry Association of America still exists. It's still out there. It's still targeting technology. It's still causing problems. And so I want to just sort of float some ideas out to you who are listening. And I know the two people who are listening right now probably have heard this sort of thing before, but I want to get it out on tape. I want it to be sort of uh, repeated so that in case other people are listening, maybe uh, they uh, should be aware of this too. So the first thing uh, to be aware of uh, is the Creative Commons. Uh, that is a type of license that turns copyright on its head that allows you to share, uh, depending on the exact terms of the Creative Commons license, to modify, to, uh, and again, depending on which Creative Commons license, to even uh, adapt parts of works as part of a broader uh, work. So for example, uh, the the little intro song uh, that you may have heard if the audio was working was a Creative Commons song uh, done by the Toga Collective. And so I can use that. I don't have to get permission. The permission is already granted as just part of the MP3 file itself for anyone who wants to, to use it as long as they're not, you know, I think that one, it might be a non-commercial one. I'm not sure. I'm not making any money off of this. Uh, if you want to throw money at me, sure, but you know, I'll, I'll see if I can find them if anyone does that. Anyway, so Creative Commons uh, works. The more Creative Commons works that are available, the less time you have uh, to spend to, uh, you know, if you're going through Creative Commons stuff, you don't have to go through the Recording Industry Association of America stuff. You, you can listen to the Creative Commons stuff, uh, practice it if you're a musician, learn the songs, uh, expose yourself to it, have it get stuck in your head, all that sort of stuff for music. Same thing for movies. If you want to have something to watch, there are Creative Commons movies out there. They're not as common. Hopefully there will be more in the future. But if we want to actually strike back at the RIAA, we have to start m kind of turning more of our lives, our collective lives, towards the Creative Commons. And you don't have to turn your whole life towards it. You know, you don't have to you know, go 100% full into it. That may, be, may not be as in the long term as good as just like trying little bits and pieces. Like try going to uh, CC Mixer or Jamendo or something like that where they do have Creative Commons music. Try something out. If you like what you hear, talk about it, etc. Um, uh, something else that I kind of encountered this week, I, I, I was reading a lot of Pain Magazine, which is the old rant radio uh, magazine, as, as part of this, you know, digging up and rehashing what re rant radio could mean. Uh, and so one of the things that Payne Magazine number three talked about is that uh, at least you know in the past, uh, maybe they've stopped doing this by now, uh, but the RAA was involved in the hacked back uh, attacks on the peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, at the time, it would probably have been something like Kazaa, uh, but there are, of course, different peer-to-peer -peer networks out there now. Uh, and the hack back uh, idea is that uh, record companies or maybe governments on behalf of record companies will attack users of peer to peer networks, will fill peer to peer networks with junk that is, you know, maybe uh, got viruses in it, like MP3s with viruses installed on it, or something to exploit their users or exploit the network or break things down and generally cause or be an ass. Um, there are people uh, who are still lobbying to change laws to, to allow the government, uh, both in the United States and Canada, to be able to do more of these kinds of attacks. In Canada, thanks to C-51, uh, the government can pretty much do whatever it wants as long as it's terrorism related and the RIA has no problem at all in turning the idea of what it wants in terms of terrorism. So if you download MP3s, if you listen to un unlicensed or even possibly Creative Commons media, or even if you listen to Spotify, you're a pirate and you're a terrorist. And that means the government can use their anti-terrorist uh, laws against you, at least according to the RAA. So anyway, so if you want to uh, stop this sort of thing, though, we can uh, use more peer-to-peer -peer software. We can make our peer-to-peer -peer software easier to use and more secure and less subject to the kinds of attacks that they make. So one of the things that we can do uh, 
And this is something where the, the, the people who are listening right now might be, you know, put in the back of your mind is start thinking about, well, you know, where are we still vulnerable? Like, where is it still possible that we could be downloading a, a virus? Like, for example, the Internet Archive is just a sitting duck right now for the RIAA and other groups to just upload viruses in because I don't think they've got the manpower to check if this is happening yet. And maybe the RIA hasn't thought of this yet, but they will. They will come to this because if it's being used to share media, it'll be used to share media that's a cop or a, a an alternative to them, a competition to them. And the, as soon as that starts to bite them in the ass, they'll come for it. So keep thinking about that. Uh, use peer-to-peer -peer networks. Use Tribbler. Tribbler. Tribbler.org. Uh, unfortunately. It, it's the, the version that is not on GitHub is still not building for me personally, but I know it works. There are still people who use it. Um, it is going to be a pain in the ass for them because it's not only a peer-to-peer -peer network, but it's also uh, got encryption, keeping some parts of it uh, from being observable from the outside world. But of course, the two people listening to this know this, uh, but for, again, the others who are maybe listening to this in retrospect, uh, consume less RAA material. Uh, try to step down the amount of uh, music you buy uh, at the CD shop uh, if it is not Creative Commons. Uh, step down the amount of music you listen to on Spotify if it's not Creative Commons. Again, go down the list. There used to be a tool of RAA, RIAA Radar. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore. That tool can be recreated. What that tool did is you put in the name of an artist or a song you're listening to, and you could find out if it's a major label or major label song, uh, if it's a major label artist, and so it would tell you. Wikipedia is still a pretty good resource to find out if, if some someone or something you are listening to is part of the RIAA or maybe just against uh, the use of uh, you know, music and the sharing of music. We can find that out. We have an internet to help us on that. Still, let's use it. Um, and so the other thing that uh, was kind of talked about in Pain magazine is the idea of paying the artist directly. Uh, one of the things that the REA really likes to hammer on is that, oh, you know, if you're downloading music, you're participating in culture, you're accessing media, you know, you're being an educated and, you know, current to the, uh, the music that's being listened to, uh, you know, music lover, then, oh, maybe you're not paying the artist and you're a dirty cheap pirate or something like that, right? Well, one of the things we can do as a group of people who want to uh, get rid of the RIAA is actually step up, pay musicians, find musicians you like, give them money. Uh, it is getting easier and easier with Bitcoin, with Ripple, with all these tools we have available to us to pay people directly and not have that middleman in between us. As soon as the, it is possible for people to pay artists for what they do, the middleman will have a rough time and it is starting to be possible. It's, not everyone uses Bitcoin, not everyone knows how to use Bitcoin, not everyone has access to the technology that would allow you to save and securely use Bitcoin. Again, these are things we can do if we are serious about taking down the RAA. Uh, Bitcoin, is, or at least something like it, uh, is part of that goal. Uh, not using Spotify. Spotify is one of those platforms that is one, owned by the, the majors, and two, uh, is just does not have anything built in it to keep you from being exposed to this you know this problem it's 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 a platform that is built to expose you to music but it's not un aware of the political problems involved in it so um normally what you could do if it was a you know free and open source platform is you could you know change the platform to allow it to give it this feature to to enable it to do this Unfortunately, Spotify is a proprietary platform that uses DRM to force its users to accept its model of how things should be. Don't use Spotify. Uh, the further away we can get from using Spotify, the better. The closer we will be able to get to a post-RIAA future if we can get away from Spotify. Uh, quote from Pain Magazine number 10. By banding together, we can be stronger than ever before. We are formidable opponents to anyone who would seek to silence us, not through intimidation, but through our solidarity and sheer perseverance. I'm pronouncing that last part right, but anyway, the point being here is it's hard sometimes. It's hard to keep up the fight. It's hard to be the one person who you know who just doesn't want to participate in this 
culture or the, this part of the culture war against the internet. Um, it is a broader uh, struggle that's going to take probably another two or three generations to hash out, and we you know may not win. The internet may lose. The internet may be broken apart into you know tiny little fiefdoms. The RA may you know force technology uh, like peer-to-peer -peer networks back uh, onto the back burner, and it it may get tough. But uh, our strength is in being able to survive and outlive them. Uh, the longer we can do that, the better. Which brings us to the next thing I kind of want to talk about, which is that uh, life doesn't always go well. Uh, and there is this thing called the just world uh, hypothesis, or the just world fallacy, or just you know this idea of a just world. And one of the things that I'm doing uh, this week uh, is going through the Rig Veda, uh, which is one of the kind of basic parts of Hinduism. Uh, but I've also, you know, read over the past couple of years of uh, the canon of Sunni Islam, Shia Islam, the, the, the Jewish Talmud, the, the New Testament, the Old Testament, you know, I've, I've gone through the list. And one of the things that is a common uh, problem across all faiths, not just the Abrahamic ones, not, you know, even, even including sometimes Buddhism, uh, is this idea that everything is going to be all right and that everything is the way it should be, especially in Islam, that everything is the way Allah made it, uh, that the book has been written and then that's how it should be. Uh, and that there's this idea that if you make a mistake, you know, it's, it's probably for the best. Or, if, you know, if someone does something bad to you, uh, that there's a reason for it and that you should, you know, equivocate that that, you know, the, all of the possible reasons on, on kind of a moral level so that the the world always remains a just place, a place of justice. Uh, unfortunately, the universe is not a just universe. Uh, it is a place where a lot of things happen, a lot of causes for uh, different events can be understood, uh, but the idea of a that all of this, everything that happens from the you know tiniest hydrogen molecule all the way to the you know the largest structures of the uh, you know the spindles of dark matter in the universe uh, have some relationship at all to justice and to something that we can for you know give the universe for. Um, it, it's too much. It's 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 just straining what you can define as justice too far, and there is. It, it, it is a excuse to kind of cop out, to kind of break down and not take the next step, which is to make justice come into being. It is up to us to act fairly to other people. It is up to us to see that the world, the solar system, the universe could be better. It is up to us to see the people in our lives suffering and in situations that are not fair and situations that they either had some hand in and did to themselves or had done to them, uh, but which people are not happy about, and to say that there is something wrong with that, and that the world is not a place that was built for us to... Uh, to and, and, and even if you accept that it, you know there was a creator, and if you start buying little bits and pieces of Islam and Christianity and stuff like that, it is still doesn't follow that the world is just. It still is possible to conceive of a world where th all of this is happening and the suffering that we entail uh, happens to us uh, and then that's just the way things are and there's you know no explanation for that right sooner or later you have to push you know why did it why am I having a bad day because you know etc 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 up until because God made it that way but why did he do it it's the question you're not you know either not allowed to ask or is not askable, not syntactically correct, or whatever. Point being that there are things that are going to not go well. Maybe one of them is going to be nuclear war, and we're going to all <laughs> perish in some kind of a threads of like nuclear holocaust. Maybe one thing is that we're just going to, you know, continue to lose ground against the RAA and artists who don't give a shit about uh, the internet and the possibilities that the internet allows and the human species itself. itself and maybe one of those things is just going to be our plans don't come to fruition. Bad things happen to good people. Uh, we don't have to be part of that. We can act 
in the little ways that we have access to, the little things that we can change in our life. Sometimes it's only a matter of cleaning your room or, you know, doing something good to someone else when you're not asked to, or, or you know, not expecting someone else, you know, even if they do something wrong, to kind of forgive them for it. All of these things are things that you can do, are things that I can do, are things that we all can do. And so the, the, the point where justice can happen is where we act. That's what I kind of want to rant about today. Anyway, so carrying on to the next thing, I'm just going to open this in another browser here because unfortunately you guys can't see it. Uh, one tweet from one Stephen Punawasi uh, is, quote, half of Canada's canola export goes to China. China just blocked one of Canada's largest canola exporters. CBC article. Let's go through this a little bit because I, I think this one needs some unpacking. Uh, Richardson International's license to ship canola re revoked, escalating trade tensions. Uh, who is the author of this? Pete Evans for CBC News. And I'll post a link to all this stuff, hopefully, where the video is posted. Uh, major canola, or, da, 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 uh, Chinese customs document dated March 1st says the country has canceled Winnipeg based agricultural handler Richardson International's. Registration means the company is forbidden to export canola seeds into the country. Uh, Richardson has been directly targeted. And they go on to talk about some kind of um, reasons why uh, it may not be trade related and that there's this fungal uh, disease known as blackleg uh, that might be involved and that maybe China's uh, officially trying to protect its its canola supply or something like that, uh, but the long story short, maybe maybe there's some of that going on or not. I'm not an expert on canola. I might be from Saskatchewan. I I see you know I see how important canola is to Saskatchewan, uh, but I also see and have seen many cases of people where, who were saying maybe a couple of months ago, uh, starting all the way going back to Trump being elected. That, oh, hey, Canada uh, can start having all these trade barriers, and it's going to be great for Canada. Uh, you know, if Trump starts putting trade barriers on us, we should just put trade barriers on them. And, you know, it, 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 all we want to do is, you know, quote unquote, protect our industries and, you know, protect our steel workers and our paper workers and all these people who, you know, depend on trade as their livelihood by making uh, American and Chinese goods more expensive. We want you know, everyone to buy Canadian, right? Well, this is going to be one of the consequences of that, uh, where suddenly our trade of our crops from Saskatchewan and Manitoba suddenly are going to not be bought by countries like China. China has a, over a billion people. Uh, canola is, you know, a crop that we can be selling to a lot of people in China, but um, it is now off the table. And so we're going to have to find you know, our, our farmers or however the, the, the marketing of that canola happens, uh, they're going to have to redirect or, or find a place to, to sell uh, something like $5 billion or a significant portion of worth of canola. And so is the market deep enough to actually take that sort of a hit? Maybe it is. I don't know. If you know, uh, maybe uh, one of the people listening, I, I know you probably know more about this than I do. Uh, you can you know make a suggestion or whatever. But uh, we, we should avoid this happening more. We should avoid this uh, happening in the future uh, by noticing that, oh, hey, there are consequences to our actions, our, 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 our tariffs are, even, even if we're tariffing just the states, it, it, it causes all these side effects. And this is one of the side effects that we really shouldn't have had happen. Um, yes, there are problems with China politically uh, that are worth kind of going through. And maybe this is worth uh, some pressure to get some more human rights in China. Maybe this is worth something like that. However, um, certainly the CBC article doesn't talk about that. Um, the CBC article is kind of like a, you know, a dry. Um, it, it has a lot of you know little details. Talks about the SMC Lavalin. Um, it goes into let's see here. Uh, it's got a video. I haven't gone through the video yet. Um, it does mention that there's great tensions between China and the U.S. and that Canada's kind of involved with that. Um, and that we've got a new uh, agriculture minister uh, that was probably part of the same shuffling that you know went on at the federal level. But long story short, uh, this is 
a big deal where we are starting to lose trade with uh, the things that make Saskatchewan's economy work. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's something to note anyway. So that, that's not the only thing though going on uh, concerning Saskatchewan and its agriculture. Uh, from GM Watch uh, Twitter, uh, linking to Sputnik News, which is always so legitimate. Uh, quote, in response to consumer demand, the Italian company Barilla, the world's largest pasta producer, has lowered the amount of glyphos or gly glyphosate, if I'm pronouncing that right, in its food products. The wheat supplied by Canada contains 100 times more of this glyphosate uh, than the new threshold. So, normally I would see a Sputnik link and go, okay, yeah, whatever. But uh, the problem here is that it's not just Sputnik. And unfortunately... I think I may have put it on this computer. Uh, let's see here. I think I may have lost it. Anyway, I did look it up, and it's not just Sputnik. It is, there are other uh, news uh, organizations who are uh, reporting the same thing. It's it just a uh, Newswire release. I'm just going to see if it is not in my history. Also. Okay, so. Uh, again, due to technical problems of this particular show, I'm going to have to rely on the Sputnik version uh, to kind of guide us on this. But again, it's this isn't a problem with the trade so much as a disagreement between the scientific community, community in Canada and in Italy slash EU. Now, the EU is tended to have uh, a stricter uh, kind of requirements on uh, pesticide use and uh, the, the kinds of chemicals that are used in farming, why are why is this happening? Like, why is there this disconnect? Uh, when I was volunteering with Ombase, there was a gentleman who came in and was interested in testing some of the sugar uh, in his life uh, for this stuff, and he found that after you know looking into building a machine to build or to, to do this testing, uh, that at least according to him, there was so much of it in our environment that it would be pointless to test because what you eat definitely has it in it. Um, w this is going to be, a, I guess, an interesting test because if the biggest pasta manufacturer in the world starts uh, cutting down on it, maybe it'll uh, open uh, the door for uh, more tests to be done as far as how harmful it is, whether it's harmful, etc. It is worrying that this is happening to us, and that this is going to, you know, hit home. Right? This is this is going to hurt farmers in Saskatchewan who uh, are are going to be no longer able to, to sell their products. So uh, this this is you know something to worry about. Now I, I can't do much about this, but um, it, it is again worth worth kind of uh, knowing about having our government actually act on it. Uh, maybe having uh, some kind of communication going on. That's clearly not going on. Uh, why did I have to find out about this through Sputnik? I don't know. We'll go from there. Anyway, uh, there's an article. So not only are we getting our crops banned from selling to other countries, uh, but we also have uh, problems here uh, in Canada uh, in the education system, particularly in the universities in Eastern Canada. I'm just going to load this article here. This is a gooder. Uh, kind of really disappointing that this article could even exist, uh, but I just want to read a little bit of it up front here. Uh, quote, Vice President of Students for Free Speech sues Critic for, among other things, calling him a free speech asshole. Uh, this is from TechDirt. Uh, TechDirt, by the way, is a great source of news. Uh, this, especially like technology, internet news, and freedom of speech news, um, something I'm kind of in favor of. Uh, so let's see if I can just tilt this a bit so I can read better. Uh, what is it, quote, what is it with these Canadian, quote, free speech defenders suing their critics for free speech? We've already covered the ridiculous lawsuits by Jordan Peterson and Gavin McInnes. We'll talk more about that later, maybe, against some of their critics, and, how, and now we can add a lawsuit by from Michelle DeFranco, if I'm pronouncing that right, whose Twitter profile notes that he is the Vice President of Finance for the University of Ottawa Students for Free Speech Club. Stop. Hold on. What the 
fuck is going on here when we have the free speech society suing people? Where is this even thinkable? University, what is going wrong with the University of Ottawa the student body right now that this can happen? Now, am I surprised when I click on his profile, this Michelle DeFranco guy, and see that our uh, premier appears to be on his profile picture? I don't know why that is, but not surprised at all. There. Anyway, uh, I, I, I just it doesn't matter what people say about you it is not acceptable at all in Canada for you to sue your critics for things that they say about you even if they say terrible things I do not think that it is at all acceptable and for someone who stands on that pedestal and says that they are for freedom of speech enough to be a vice president it is so high in the hypocrisy uh, level to to be doing this. This is the opposite of free speech. This is silencing people, using the court system to force your will on other people. Ridiculous. Uh, so, uh, let's see. Uh, he lawyered up saying, sending a cease and desist, demanding that uh, people, you know, this other person, his critic, take down the post and start referring to him as anything remotely connected to bigotry or alt-right uh, provide a written apology and retraction and pay 2000 to lawyers. Okay, so I do have some understanding where he is coming from on this. Uh, it is getting way too easy to call people uh, things like alt-right uh, and to immediately associate people on the conservative side of the spectrum with Nazis. Uh, it's getting, as far as I can tell, I've, seen, I, I've started keeping a list of all the people I've seen can, who have been accused of being either Nazis, fascists, alt-right, or alt-right adjacent, uh, in situations where it's completely ridiculous to, to imagine that that person would be describable by any of those terms. The most recent one off the top of my head is Cash Hill. Cash Hill is a privacy-centered uh, journalist, probably left-leaning, probably more interested in personal freedom than most of the people on the internet. But one of her recent commenters called her a fascist. Uh, again, it's it's... A, it, we are the, the 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 length of Godwin's law threads are getting way too short. Now, part of that is because real Nazis are out there. Alt right is out there. There are people out there uh, who push this I, these ideas forward. But at the same time, there are still moderate conservatives out there. There are still moderate centrists. There are still moderate leftists, etc. Not everyone is a Nazi, and so I understand when he is. Oh. What is going on here? Okay, so we're going to try to do this without the screen capture. Hopefully that makes a little bit of a difference. Uh, I don't know when we were cut off in that last rant, but uh, I, I, I was trying to, to kind of get across the point that it is understandable that he would be upset with someone accusing him, rightly or wrongly, of being part of the art all right. But it still does not justify suing someone over it. Uh, you can be wrong. You can ask the public and point out to the public, oh, hey, you know, I'm not actually a Nazi. And if you're not actually a Nazi, people will do their research and then, you know, support you. Or maybe if you are a Nazi, they'll tell you so and, you know, we can have a debate uh, using our freedom of speech that we have left to kind of hash that out. But when we start getting the courts involved and the lawyers involved, it stops being a matter of what idea is right and what idea is wrong. It starts being a matter of who can afford the best lawyers and who has access to the courts and who's rich enough to afford these sorts of things. And it stops being about freedom. It starts being about privilege and class. And that is what exactly is wrong with this, this situation of this uh, Michelle DeFranco character uh, and the University of Ottawa students who are not uh, freaking out about this. I, I, I understand it's probably close, you know, it's like reading week or something right now, so maybe it's, you know, you have your classes or any, you know, stuff like that to worry about. But still, this this is ridiculous. This is painting our country as a laughing stock that the people, the, the student who should be defending the ability of other students more than almost anyone else uh, is themselves victimizing people. Uh, in one of the worst possible ways, uh, at least along these lines. Okay, so uh, you'd think that that would be the only 
kind of student involved with uh, free speech issues in Canada that is absolutely ridiculous right now. Uh, but it's not. And so there's another one on the list uh, that I want to talk about a little bit. Uh, I had never heard of this Michelle DeFranco character. I have heard of the the U Ottawa Students for free, free Speech before, or at least similar student groups. But, you know, in, in that case, it's just one guy uh, making a bad call. This is not, you know, it, it maybe there's just no one around him to, like, tell him that, oh, hey, you're making a huge mistake. Uh, and that's all that there needs to be done. This next person does not have that excuse. They have been in the spotlight for months. Uh, Lindsay Shepard uh, on Twitter uh, at New World Hominin, uh, quote, uh, according to academic at Jeffrey A. Sachs, uh, which is, I think, one of the professors at her university, um, quote, I am a coward and a hypocrite. I suppose he believes Joel Rambucana and Pinlot are the heroes of courage and conviction in the Laurier story. And P.S. I publicly stated some causes I directed money towards if I win. And she links to a picture. Former TA she Lindsay Shepard sues Wilfred Laurier for $3.6 million uh, in a couple of kind of back and forths about uh, why she uh, would consider doing that, uh, i.e. people are saying bad things about her and what she would do with the money, i.e. invest it in a free speech student organizations similar to the one from the University of Ottawa. Now, that being said, if she actually wins and takes that money and does something like that, you know, great, whatever. That, that's a nice thing to do with money, but it still is from suing a school. It is still from taking money from education, from what should be going into uh, the, the, the promotion of, of free thought and the criticism of ideas, including student ideas, that this is going to be coming from. Now, granted, from all accounts, Wilfred Laurier has not been living up to uh, what the ideal of a university should be, and especially in her case. I have been following her case a little bit. I did see the video that she secretly took of her inquisition. I understand that it is an inquisition, having gone through a similar process myself, that there is this thing out there that where people feel entitled to target students and to force them into ideological straitjackets to keep them from expressing certain things, true or false, without appeal to reason, without appeal to evidence, just because they say so. I get that. But it's when she takes that step, when she brings the court system in, as opposed to being the victim of the court system, she stops being that victim. She had everything going, and I know she didn't choose to be in this limelight. I understand that there's pressure on her to do something, and that there are people who have, you know, how many followers has she got right now? Uh, 78,000 followers. That's huge. That's you know, way bigger than I am. It's, you know, so many people have given her attention, good and bad, analyzing what she's done, telling her that her actions are bullshit or not. There is a feedback present in her case. So there is no excuse for her to, uh, for this act, this, this act of bringing what should be a reasonable debate into the legal system. Now, she is all, before this, she was targeted and people are suing her for things that she would, may have said or may not have said. In that case, uh, she would have been in the right uh, to not, you know, to, to, as, as a victim of this process. Uh, and as that underdog, where regardless of whether or not you agree with her politically, you should stand up and say, oh, hey, you know, what is happening to her is wrong. It's university or you know, whatever TAs or professors shouldn't be suing their students over things that they say. That's ridiculous. But she's burned all of that goodwill now. She had all sorts of goodwill that she could have used. Now, maybe that she doesn't personally value that. You know, I'm just one person. What do, you know, who cares what I think? But that, that act, the taking of what should be a, a, a fight for all students everywhere that she was winning, she had brought public attention to in a way that I had never seen before in this country, and now she's thrown it away, and we're going to have to wait another probably 10, 15 years for someone else to be subject to the same kinds of problems that she is subject to, 
uh, who is the courage like she had to stand up to it but who doesn't also have the moral flaw that they're willing to use the legal system to break a university over their personal petty vendetta anyway it just pisses me off so much how f close she got but just is failing at this point to do the right thing anyway it's easy to, to kind of stand from the side of course and to say oh yeah well you should do this or you should do that i mean she did better than i did but up until this point i wouldn't have done the next step personally but anyway i have something else to play to for you to listen to just going to get it queued up here uh, actually, I have two things uh, here. I've been listening to a lot of The Voice of Long Island, which was a precursor to uh, radio show Off the Hook, which is still on WBAI 99.5 FM New York, uh, and available on the internet if you are interested in listening to. Um, it is from 1981, 1982, uh, but it, 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 it's just got little bits and pieces of really cool things in it and this is one of them so hopefully it comes through okay and hopefully you can hear and enjoy let's hear this <laughs> does that sound familiar to you hi i'm barry reagan and last year over eight million americans fell victim to video addiction where you won take this simple test have you read How to Beat Pac-Man more than twice this week? When you cash your paycheck, do you take it in quarters? Have you been unable to do your laundry this month because you've spent all your loose change? If you answered yes to these questions, don't panic because now there's help. Video Addicts Anonymous is a nonprofit self-help corporation run by and for video addicts. People just like you. Remember, Video addiction is a disease, not an illness. So if you think you might need us, jot down this number, 800-631-1146. That's 800-631-1146 for Video Addicts Anonymous. We're here to help. The public service announcement of the Advertising Council and this radio station. We're here to help of the advertising. We're here to help of the advertising of the advertising 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 here to help the advertising 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 here to help the advertising 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 So that, that, that I thought was kind of neat. A uh, little blast from the past, given how much people are freaking out about not only video games, but uh, YouTube and, well, hey, probably live streams of uh, stuff like InfoWars, right? Where there's this like, addictive property of screens that you know, draws so many of us to uh, media like this uh, that hopefully uh, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of a... Uh, benefit from so it's 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 a long way coming on that one anyway so uh there's that uh oh, open the wrong link here let's open the right one um so one of the other things that happened uh in addition to the loss of the inf treaty uh was quote and this one is from nordic.businessinsider.com. Trump quietly rewrote the rules of drone warfare, which means the U.S. can now kill civilians in secret. Uh, U.S. President Donald Trump signed an executive order entering, or ending mandatory reporting of civilian deaths from U.S. airstrikes outside combat zones. Rights groups criticized the removal of Obama-era requirement, calling the move deeply wrong and da dangerous for public accountability. Reports showed up to 117 deaths from 2009 through 2016. The Trump administration did not release a 2017 report. Now, there's a couple things not mentioned here. 
uh, when they say civilian deaths here, they mean like they can't possibly describe the people who were killed as non-civilians. Uh, this is the, they blew up a wedding party or they blew up, you know, someone who was known to be a reporter as in the case of the collateral murder video in WikiLeaks collateral murder. Uh, this is things like that. This is, you know, maybe blue on blue deaths, that sort of thing. Anytime that it is a uh, young man, uh, possibly with a weapon, it's immediately assumed to be a terrorist. And so they don't count towards this. Uh, and there's probably quite a bit of people who were not actually quote unquote terrorists uh, who were not part of those 117 deaths. And yet even that, even that is not enough. We can't know how many people were just blatantly murdered by the US government and they're flying killer robots uh, anymore. Thank you, Donald Trump. Uh, so this is a problem that is building. It is still, uh, you know, maybe not as big of a deal as global thermonuclear war uh, in terms of, you know, how many people are being pinned off by this. But still, it's we have a government to the south of us who has an army of flying killer robots that are killing with an impunity, and we're not even allowed to know anymore how what they're doing and how many people they're killing. Uh, and it, it was bad enough under the Obama administration where Obama was the, you know, able to use these, this army of flying killer robots to you know, kill people without trial, without reason that they should be killed, uh, without anyone other than basically him and his you know, little tiny process that he had set up that was not accountable to the public at all, uh, or not even really all that accountable to the courts in the US uh, to just kill who he wanted. And yeah, sure, right now, at least in the past you know, couple of years, it's probably mostly targeting people like uh, members of Dawah al-Islamia. It's probably targeting you know, the Somali pirates or something like that. Someone that we, most people would agree that, okay, well, you know, is their life really worth getting into a political argument for? Really? Think about it. But now that we can't know, there's no oversight to know who it's targeting. We don't know anymore. There's this shroud around us keeping us from finding out that, oh, hey, maybe tomorrow it'll come start pinning off people in Canada. Maybe it'll start pinning off people in Eastern Europe or, or in Russia. Or, you know, who knows? We don't know. It's, 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 a, it's just purely within the, the executive of the United States to be capable of this kind of just blood. It's murder. It's, it's absolutely murder. This is what people, you know, if, if Trump had himself gone and done what these robots are doing for him, we would throw him away. This is a war crime. What is going to be going on uh, with these flying killer robots? So um, it's, it's the people in your life should know about these things. They should know that the US government is now just openly capable of murdering people with no oversight whatsoever. Uh, and, and not only is the US government capable of doing, but anyone who controls the platform that these robots run on I think it's still currently Linux, but Microsoft is not that far away from just, you know, getting a government contract. You know, Google and Microsoft are right now kind of fighting against each other to, you know, not have military contracts, but someone is building these robots. Maybe it's Raytheon or Lockheed Martin or something like that. I, I don't personally know, but that, that company now has basically a license to murder and not get caught. If their firmware decides, oh hey, this person, this person should die, you know, the, this person speaking out too much about our products, you know, that 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 is now getting easier and easier to do. Um, maybe we're not there yet. Maybe the, the robots, there's still enough military oversight and you know where where things are flying around in the sky. But you can see when people start to freak out in airports when they see a drone, right? The, the whole airport closes, and so there there is this level of like. The, understanding that people are slowly cluing in that, oh, hey, drones can be fit to kill people. And not only can they be fit by the US government to, tro to kill people, that there, there's this failure of the process to control this and to make it uh, do so in a way that at least people can know whether it's done in you know, a justifiable way, uh, if you can justify murder. Anyway, enough about drones. Uh, I was going to talk about one other thing that I think I'm going to save for next week because this is going a little bit longer due to the technical problems uh, with this show. Um, I, I do have one more thing 
that I want to play for you. I have sent this to a couple of people. I don't know if anyone's actually listened to it yet, uh, but I uh, really enjoyed hearing it. Uh, it's a little bit longer, so uh, you'll be in for ho hopefully um, the whole thing. Uh, but be before I play it, I just want to point, point out that uh, I an intend on doing this every week. And so uh, if you have anything that you want me to talk about uh, or anything you'd like me to do maybe a little, little bit differently other than you know, fix the audio problems. Yeah, I'm working on that. Uh, you can ricochet me at ricochet colon M S Z I S N for Neptune, A F for Foxtrot, seven V for Victor, Q Q P for Penguin, H for Hotel, R for Romeo, D for Delta, all lower case. Uh, Ricochet.im is the instant message uh, chat that I use. You can get a hold of me. I uh, usually see everything within about a day. And, uh, and often online as well. Uh, and so if you have any Creative Commons media to play, I would love to have access to more. Uh, I have a hard drive full of this stuff, but hey, uh, if you have something you want to hear or have other people hear, this is the, the place, this, this stream, both live on Facebook, on YouTube, and anywhere else where I post this. Uh, let's, let's get a, a place where people can be promoted. Um, and let's build from that. Uh, as I, uh, the, this episode specifically, uh, the, there's a, a lot from uh, Pain Magazine, P-A-1-N Magazine, uh, including the little skull that I had at the beginning of the, the stream, uh, assuming anyone saw that. Uh, as I mentioned, Voice Over Long Island, uh, which you can, uh, I'll include a link to somewhere where this video is posted. Um, it's not necessarily something everyone should listen to because there's just so much audio there. Uh, but hey, you know, if you're ever bored, it's, it's there. And it's, it's, it's something that you can download uh, right now if you felt like it. And uh, a big shout out to the uh, UFCW 1400, who as far as I know are still on strike in Saskatoon, trying to fight for better wages for the future. Uh, what they're doing is really cool. I kind of wanted to talk more about it this week, but I think I'm going to save that till next week. Um, as I kind of mentioned, uh, if, if you like this show uh, and you like the media on it, um, you can you know, go to my subscriber store or Villages, uh, send me something there. Of course, that is totally optional and I'm you know, fine if you don't, but hey, it's there if you have the interest for it. So uh, I'm going to close out with this last uh, MP3 here that I've kind of cut up. It is a little bit longer, uh, so hopefully uh, future shows will be a little bit shorter. Uh, but uh, I'd like to play the whole thing because it's just it's part of my my youth was watching the the media put together by this author. So um, we'll see uh, if ever anyone else enjoyed this as much as I did. And I will catch you all next week. Uh, Jeff out. <laughs> Hello, this is David Goodman for WUSB Stony Brook. With me in the studios today is Gene Roddenberry. Widely known as creator and producer of Star Trek, the TV series and movie. Welcome to Stony Brook, Mr. Roddenberry. Thank you, delighted to be here. Beautiful day. Yes, it is, isn't it? Um, my first question, of the many artistic hats that you wear, author, director, producer, which one do you consider yourself first and foremost? Writer. You consider yourself a writer? To me, that's basic to everything. Mm -hmm. And after being a, a, a writer, would you consider yourself a producer or a director? A, a producer. I, I've done very little directing. I, I, I really think of the producer as, a, as not a, so much a business role as, as, as part of the storytelling job. So I am a storytelling producer. And, and, and as the producer, particularly in television, I'm responsible for uh, mm -hmm. opticals, costumes, and, and many other things. Mm -hmm. How, have you always been interested in storytelling? Yes, very much so, since, uh, since a child, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of being an author or director, what would you rather, rather be known for in terms of the public? Or what do you think the public thinks of you? I was a else? great lover, but I, I never made it. <laughs> okay. Um, 
When you began your, your professional career as a writer late in the 1940s, um, was your objective then to write for TV? Yes, as a matter of fact, when I really got serious about writing, television had just come out and they had these sets you bought for $900, which had a little tiny six inch screen. And uh, I did, I did, I think, show some promise in it, being able to look at the future because I, it occurred to me that this really was the storytelling medium and the, and the communications medium of the future. It immediately seemed to me that it was probably as, as important a revolution as the uh, Gutenberg press. And so mm -hmm. uh, this is where I headed immediately. Mm -hmm. Was one of your objectives to write science fiction at the onset? No, and, and I don't really consider myself a science fiction writer today. I, I am a writer. I think it's wrong for writers to carve themselves up and say, I write science fiction or I write detective stories. To me, as a, a writer is, is a writer. Science fiction is something that all writers should look into because it's a, there's just no more marvelous way to make comments about a man in society. Have you ever done any writing or producing for radio? Never have, and I'd like to try. You would it like would to be great fun to have the theater of the mind. I've, I've often thought I, I would like someday to do uh, some Star Treks or something on that order for radio. Mm -hmm. Well, you did say that you don't like to pigeonhole yourself into being considered a science fiction writer, but um, in 1954 you did sell your first science fiction script. Could you tell our listeners uh, what that script was about? Oh, well, you do good research. That <laughs> that was for that was a story about a, a couple of aliens who we pick up as they are here in human form, and their job is really to uh, see that this planet is destroyed because it's getting into nuclear weapons and so on before it's time and before it's really ready for it. The name of it was the Secret Defense of One One Seven. And the secret defense turned out to be this, you know, this thing that uh, we we humans know as love, which their civilization did not have. Mm -hmm. And it starred, uh, among others, Ricardo Montalban. And it was great fun. See, although I worked with Ricardo three or four times since, it was great fun to again see him uh, on the set of our new Star Trek II movie. Mm. That's very very interesting. Did that show appear on uh, network television? Yes, it appeared on uh, Chevron Theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, and a number of other times, uh, but in those days, our, we didn't residuals weren't that important, and so I never really did a, get a list of everywhere it appeared. At that time, were you were you thinking of Star Trek, or was that still something you know way in the future? I wasn't thinking of Star Trek specifically at that time, but I had made up my mind when the time was right that I would do a science fiction because what I had seen in science fiction up to then, I hadn't thought much of. It seemed to me they that most film and image science fiction really violated the basic rules of drama, which are stories are about people. And science fiction writers and producers so often tried to make them about gadgets, and gadgets are not that interesting. And so mm -hmm. uh, when I felt the time was right to come out with a, the science fiction series I'd been thinking about, I sat down and did the Star Trek uh, introduction. Mm -hmm. um, as an award-winning author, what can you suggest to, to young um, just starting out, writers, science fiction writers? Write. Just to keep writing. Really, write. Write like 500 words a day, every day, uh, whether you've got a cold, whether you feel, particularly if you don't feel like it, keep writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, assuming you have uh, uh, good average intelligence and, uh, and you are an omnivorous reader, why, you undoubtedly will begin to sell. Thank God most people give up before they get there. Otherwise, we'd be up to our knees and reader and writers, mm. and most people do give up. Mm. But the, the trick is not to. Okay. Um, when 1966 did roll around and you created Star Trek, my question is, why did you create Star Trek? Was there a certain purpose other than just creating a new television series? The primary thing I had in mind was I wanted to do something where I wasn't trapped by the terrible censorship which was going on in television at that time where you really couldn't write about anything of any importance. And it seemed to me that I might do what Jonathan Swift had done when he could not write about his times. He invented Gulliver's Travels and got away with it. And sure enough, by putting them out of my, having them poking out of people out on far off planets, we 
cut it past the network sensors. They had, they didn't know what we were talking about. All, all the fourteen-year-olds did, but it went over their heads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I noted in reading biographies about you that you were a, a commercial pilot. Um, right, Pan Am. Did your experience as a pilot influence your creation of Captain Kirk, let's say, as the pilot of a starship? Oh, yes. I think, undoubtedly, uh, the bridge was run in a much more responsible, logical way than, than many other writers would have, would have written it, because I, I had that experience. Also, I think it influenced Kirk. Yes, he, all, all writers' characters owe something to their secret dreams and longings. And Kirk was very much the, the, the captain that uh, I, I dreamed of being totally uh, cool, totally right, totally capable. And of course, no one ever is quite that. Mr. Spock came very much the same way. I had screwed up so many times in my life out of emotion. I thought it would be fun to write myself without emotion. So what you're saying is that the, the several of the main characters are compilations of your own personalities? trying to express themselves? Somebody said years and years ago, I, f I, f I forget the author, but it said uh, writing is very much uh, a thing of masturbating in the public, in, in front of the public, and, mm. and there's a great deal of truth in that. Uh, uh, we, we all do it in all of our characters. We, I think uh, uh, most writers who are not hacks, uh, whoever they write, e even a woman, is some piece of themselves or some piece of a dream self. You, you really, as much as an actor, when you write seriously, you become that character while you're writing it. Mm -hmm. Do you look back at the old uh, reruns and say to yourself, I wish there was something in particular I, I should have done differently? Oh, God, yes. I, because, you know, making those shows, anytime you make an, an adve action adventure, particularly when you add up the opticals and, and new costumes every show, different foreign scenes and so on, it was sometimes it just seemed a bloody miracle that we had a beginning and a middle and an end there. And uh, when I look back at the episodes, I do, I used to do a great deal of writhing. I said, oh, Jesus, if we just had another hour, if we just had $600 more. But lately I don't so much because I think I've developed a, a sense of... Uh, Look, we, we did our damnedest, we, we, we did our best, and uh, what we did people generally like, and why not swing with that? Mm -hmm. I've noticed in, in many of the episodes that you've either written or have been adapted from your stories that there's a very important social mes message being transmitted. Um, for instance, uh, such episodes as the Omega Glory, Bread and Circuses, and in particular, Assignment Earth, where Gary Seven came down to try and prevent the Earth from destroying itself with nuclear weapons. Uh, my question is, how successful, in your opinion, has TV been in transmitting social commentary? Well, TV should be much better than it is. Uh, it has been good. Star Trek, uh, from the very first, did that. It wasn't just those shows. Much of it was uh, very unnoticeable, unless you probe, like uh, Devil in the Dark. We had a very ugly monster. We, we learned was was a mother protecting us young one of the very one of the basic themes of star trek all the way through is to look differently is not to be necessarily ugly or to think differently is not necessarily to be wrong we had a, and other a few others have done it where you have people who tried very hard such as uh, the archie bunker uh, uh show what was its original name all in the family, all in the family. Uh, in fact uh, uh they showed not only uh him, but they also showed that the liberals and mod can can often get as silly in their direction. I think that uh, a show of the Barney Miller show uh, has nice little comments about society. This and, and these shows invariably become the very very popular show, the standards, the classics. Unfortunately, most of television doesn't make any effort to do that. For instance, most police shows, really, if, 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 if there's any theme in it, is, uh, is the, the best thing to do with criminals is to shoot them and put them in jail, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason being, of course, that television is not basically an entertainment medium. Television is there to sell products. Mm -hmm. And uh, what gets on the air is, uh, is something that uh, will sell more beer or more hemorrhoid ointment than the next show, which is patently a ridiculous way for a society to choose uh, something as, as powerful as sound and image is. I think that 
someday will be very ashamed that we spent all of those years doing that. It hasn't always been like that because artists are really, although they can be crackpots, lunatics, uh, nasty, um, undependable, they, they, they all have that little thing about fighting to make something better, and we had enough of those in television that we kept it from being utterly bad. Mm -hmm. Is there today, or should there be a, a movement against the movement towards more commercials and more advertising? Well, thank God our engineers have created a movement, and our scientists, by uh, bringing us cable and satellite television. Now, there's a, there's a whole telecommunications revolution going on in which uh, we've discovered we can have thousands of channels if we want them. And the time is here now, and it's just beginning. And, and let me say to those interested in the arts and in telecommunications, boy, you couldn't get a better time to get in because now what's going on with cable TV coming along is like the early days when I went into television where there were openings you could get in. Uh, so net, networks will soon be relegated to a, to a much lesser piece of the pie. Eventually, we're going to have a type of television in which you can dial your phone or your computer hook up or whatever, and order something out of an electronic library whenever you want it and have it sent directly to your house. You won't even have to keep the, uh, mm. the records or, or the tapes. And so uh, uh, this, is helping, this is helping a great deal. Sure, I, I, I don't know why the public hasn't uh, uh, stood up against the networks now. If you do a, if you do a half hour show, seven or eight minutes of it have become commercials now. Thank God, I remember when uh, people objected when, when it was uh, two minutes, mm -hmm. and now it's seven or eight, and, and they're not objecting. They, they've really been brainwashed into accepting it. Mm. Actually, I, uh, I don't mind one commercial uh, an hour. It's, uh, well, one thing I have against uh, some, some of the pay TV is, is that you, you never get an excuse to go to the bathroom. <laughs> That's true. But other than that, I wish they'd do away with it. You them. can't get up for a snack. <laughs> yes. Um, um, do you think that with these new technologies, for instance, being able to buy products over your, through your TV set, do you think that will make people more prone to just sitting at home and just sitting in front of that TV? Do you think that's where the technology is leading people? No, I, I, I think a great deal more of, I have a much higher opinion of the human animal than that. That, mm -hmm. that of course, is what uh, some of the monks said in the beginning when they got the printing press, you know. Mm -hmm. You teach them to read, give them books, and forget it, they'll never go out again. And, of course, that, that doesn't happen. Young, alive, exciting people always have to get out and, and get with the world. Mm. As a matter of fact, if, uh, if our television in future is what it should be, it would encourage them mm -hmm. to get out because the excitement of what's all around them is transmitted to them by uh, the, the, what they see on television. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, of course, what we people in the business that I'm in and that you're moving in, uh, uh, that's, that's a responsibility we have, mm -hmm. and a serious one. Mm -hmm. If you just tuned in, you're listening to WUSB, and speaking with me today is Gene Roddenberry. Mr. Roddenberry, I want to get back to a question I asked you before about um, TV's um, ability to transmit social commentary. Do you feel that science fiction, in particular, is the best uh, genre to transmit social commentary? Well, it certainly can be the most exciting because rather than having problems with unbelievability and, and doing a, a story, but trying to fit things into a story today, in science fiction you can, you can pick a subject and surround it with elements that really highlight the subject. You can, uh, if, you, if you want to do a story of how bad prisons are, uh, you can, as they did recently, make a prison city, and uh, and if if you want to if you want to discuss as we did that to be different is not ugly, you have a better chance. Yes, it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. It's a very exciting way to do that, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about the recent influx of these B grade horror movies? Um, why why do you feel now all of a sudden um, Hollywood is producing all these movies? Well, Hollywood has always done ridiculous things like that. That's because uh, Hollywood is basically run by um, 
businessmen. Studios today are run by accountants, attorneys, uh, agents, who in their own business are fine, but uh, but they gravitate to the to the, the top of these places and they they make movies on on the basis of. Uh, of the way other businesses are run, if, if the product is selling high, why not make another one like it, another one like it? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's nothing new, uh, and I'm, I'm afraid it, it it will always be this way, at least under the our our present uh, economic system. Mm. In terms of uh, the Star Trek series, does it surprise you when every year that the every year that the show's in syndication, new hordes of um, viewers tune in and become quote-unquote Trekkies? Oh, hell yes. It's, How do you feel about that? Well, you know, I, I never expected any of these things to happen. I, I hoped when I wrote it, started writing it and, and produced it at first that you know, I would meet people in years to come that would say, hey, that thing you did, I, I kind of liked it. And uh, But, uh, wow, it, it, it got sort of ridiculous. Uh, People have asked me, you know, did you, did you expect this when you wrote it? I said, what, what, say, what kind of an idiot would sit down and say, let's see, what will I do this afternoon? Well, I, I, I think I'll create a phenomenon. You know, you just... Do you feel you've left, a, you've left a legacy? Well, the thing I like that we did is, number one, we showed a whole audience a positive, optimistic view of the future. We can make it. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we, this creature is, is really something. The other thing is our heroes were really almost old-fashioned heroes in their, their honor. They did not lie. They, they believed that there were some, some things you risk your life for. That isn't too bad to spread around a bit. The other thing is it did introduce science fiction to a nationwide audience. Uh, parents being forced to see it by their college student children began to re be see it, then began to read some science fiction. It encouraged universities all over to require some science fiction in, in a sophomore year as sort of a mind expander. And, uh, and yes, that's, it's, it's nice to know that we, we did get people reading Huxley and things like that. Mm -hmm. in, terms of, so mm -hmm. in terms of your own life, do you feel that your lifestyle has changed? Uh, are you swamped on the street you know, with autograph seekers? No, I, you know, I'm not like an actors have it tough. It's hard for Leonard Nimoy or someone like that to go to down to McDonald's or, or Burger King. Mm -hmm. um, I have no such trouble. The only time I, I run into anything is at a gas station or somewhere. I'll, I'll give them a credit card and they'll look at my name, which in the credit card is E.W. Roddenberry. And they'll sometimes ask, hey, do you know Gene Roddenberry? Mm -hmm. And I will invariably reply, one of the things I want most to do is to get to know him, hmm. which, of course, is, is a problem we all face with ourselves. Mm -hmm. The first letter E standing for Eugene yes, Rodman. Um, if you'll allow me right now, I'd like to read a quote from uh, a novel that you wrote. It's the, it's the novelization of the Star Trek, Star Trek the motion picture, and I'd like to read a quote from your, from your preface, in which you write, I have always looked upon the Enterprise and its crew as my own private view of Earth and humanity in microcosm. During its voyages, the Starship Enterprise always carried much more than mere respect and tolerance for other life forms and ideas. It carried the more positive force of love for the almost limitless variety within our universe. It is this capacity for love of all things which has always seemed to me the first indication that an individual or a race is approaching adulthood. Well, that was written in 1979, and it's now 1982. Do you feel that our, our nation, our world, is making any strides in this direction? Yes, we, we are making progress. We do make strides. I, I know it often seems like it's three steps forward and two back. And lately, in this country, it seems to me that we're on the backward steps with our fury over Central America and our, our uh, you know, paranoid fear that uh, some bad outsider is really influencing things everywhere, but I think we, I think we, we do make, we do make strides. I think that also certain things happening today are going to push us forward. And in my talk here at uh, Stony Brook, I 
address that particular subject is uh, are we going to make it mm -hmm. and uh, what things will help us do. Mm -hmm. Very recently, several actors and, and um, media personalities have gotten involved in politics. Is there any statements you'd like to make or do you not get involved in the political scene? Or I prefer to do my talking in, in books and uh, although on, on shows like this, I you know I'll respond honestly to mm -hmm. any question. Uh, my 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 basic statement is that uh, is is what you read there, and 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 adding to that that uh, we we all have uh, to bring these things about very definite personal responsibilities, and we have a responsibility not to be silent, and that's particularly true of of uh, people in colleges, I think, and. I hope that uh, we'll get eventually somewhere, somewhere back near the 60s when mm -hmm. people were speaking out and pointing their finger at hypocrisy when they saw it. Mm -hmm. Is there? Do you have any new books or new book uh, to be published soon? Or I have I have one I'm writing, which is is which is a story of this country about 70 years from now when uh, we we have lost our middle class and the the society is broken down into into uh, the people who are really the workers and, and the execs, mm -hmm. and uh, automation has really eliminated the middle class, which is a very interesting thing to think about and to write. I'm currently doing a pilot for ABC, mm -hmm. which we're looking at the near future, 20, 30, or 40 years ahead, and uh, we'll have a weekly look at it. And our, one of our first looks has to do with uh, law enforcement. We see, I see in it the, the police process breaking down, and uh, and I see the neighborhood watch becoming a more and more important thing, in, in which we begin to take the responsibility for protecting ourselves. Mm -hmm. And like all, like all writers, I always have two or three things in the notebook I'm jotting away on. Mm -hmm. I just have one other question about this about the the series. Um, which ran from '66 to 1968, I believe. Um, it's been compared to the to Horatio Hornblower. Would you like to comment on that? <laughs> yes. It, uh, as a matter of fact, my Captain Kirk was very much based on uh, the style of Captain Kirk was based on Hornblower. Of course, Hornblower, written by C.S. Forrester, who Hemingway called the greatest adventure writer in the English language. Uh, it, it, it has Hornblower style, although Hornblower, the, the 19th century sea captain, of course, uh, uh, had, had nothing of, uh, of Kirk's uh, view of the, the beauty of, uh, of aliens and, and that joy of diversity. Hornblower was rather a stuffy English sea captain who, who kind of liked uh, when he got to be a, a sir and then a lord. Mm -hmm. but, but it charming, charming books, and, and uh, I had Shatner read a couple of them before we started shooting the series, and he took them very much to heart, and I think that added a great deal to his performance. That's very interesting. Um, speaking of aliens, what was there anything used in particular to model your aliens after? Budget. Mm -hmm. we, in, the, in the television series, we, we had all sorts of ideas for aliens, but we just couldn't afford the appliances at the time. Spock used to take hour 45 minutes to even get his ears on mm -hmm. and uh, and we, we didn't have another $25 even to spend in the uh, in the Star Trek the motion picture we of course changed our Klingons slightly I told the director to by all means do what he thought was right to because we were no longer limited to mm -hmm. to actors who, who uncomfortable you know they always come with two arms and two legs and it's very they're very difficult to change mm -hmm. and but I, I was amazed to see the fans, many of them rose up against, how dare you change our Klingons? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, one of my first stories, I was going to have a little, uh, the Telosians were going to be little crab-like creatures. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably good that I didn't have the money to do things like that. I think the audience certainly was not prepared for that. Even as, even with having Star Trek with essentially 20th century heroes, my own father, he sat there the night the show, first show came on, and he listened to it very quietly, and then he went out and apologized to all the neighbors. So I think it's fortunate I didn't have a better budget. 
Mm. In terms of the third season episodes, 1968, um, was the budget really getting thin at that point? I'm speaking in particular of one episode, Spectre of the Gun, where the sets themselves were those old, you know, stick-up sets that the ho Hollywood used to use. And I've heard talk that the reason those sets were used in that episode was because there wasn't enough money to build. Now, strangely sets. enough, that was not the reason. It was really an effort to uh, to create a a feeling. Of, uh, mm -hmm. of, of a dreamlike feeling where you didn't see uh, every nail hole and every board mm -hmm. and dreams are sometimes like that and, and, and I've heard many people say that but really that was no problem because in those days we did have western set just sets just sitting there to be used mm -hmm. but but money was always a problem I remember one show we we had uh, I think we had $243 left unspent, and it suddenly occurred to us we hadn't done the aliens yet. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I told our then associate producer, Bob Jessman, that he had to do the aliens for $243. And he uh, put his hand on his head and went running out, screaming that I was crazy. Mm -hmm. But somehow our people always managed to do those things. They did it with sort of a little puppet thing. Mm -hmm. I could just imagine you... Um walking up to DeForest Kelly and asking him if he has any money, and he would say, I'm a doctor, not a millionaire. <laughs> he would indeed. <laughs> I'm sorry they didn't do that in the first movie. I tried to get him to use that mm -hmm. Kelly joke. Mm -hmm. I just have one final question. Can you tell us anything about the new movie, uh, the date it'll, it'll be released, and any back room news that you can give us? And my, my question out of extreme curiosity is, will Mr. Spock die? Okay, well, first on the... On the movie, I, from, I've, I only, I've only seen a rough cut without uh, many opticals and without sound and music and the final trims and everything, without the really magic that makes a picture come alive. Mm -hmm. But from what I have seen of it, it, uh, it uh, has much more action than the first movie. I think it uses the secondary characters much better. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, many of them have very, very important parts in it. We have um, the opticals should be very very good because they're they're going to be they're being done by the by the people who do the opticals done all the opticals for Star Wars all of mm -hmm. the Star Wars movies. It I felt to me that some of the characters were half, perhaps a little too melodramatic, and some of the science wasn't taken as much care of as as I prefer to do it when I do them myself. But uh, on the other hand. Uh, some of the some of the uh, final effects will probably make it move much faster in there, and, and also they they I've I've given them memos on those things, and they are they are trying to straighten them out. I I think uh, it has a good chance of being a movie you like. Mm -hmm. About Mr. Spock, whether he dies or not, uh, I must remind you I I am in show business, and uh, and you're going to have to find out in the movie. That's all right, Mr. Roddenberry. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. You've been listening to Gene Roddenberry, award-winning author and producer. For WUSB Stony Brook, I'm David Goodman. Thank you.